Okay, so this video is actually very relevant to the talk I'm going to be giving today. Um, All right, the title of the seminar is Let's Give Them Something to Talk About. Um, for those of you who haven't met me, I'm Kayvon Shargi. I'm the visiting science journalist at KITP, and I'm covering the neuroscience program. Um, and today, we are going to discuss how with only a few images and video clips, you can introduce new audiences to your science. Um, and I will be giving actually two talks this week. My second one is tomorrow, same time, 2 p.m. is auditorium. And they both have a common theme. And the theme is how to use online media as an entry point for people to connect with you and your research. So today's seminar is focused on your research part. Tomorrow's we're, tomorrow we're going to focus on, um, on you. OK, so first question is, where does this media come from? Well, it actually begins with the research and the images that come out of your everyday investigations. Um, where are the images where you know, you're sitting at the lab bench, maybe you see something interesting under the microscope, you capture that image, and then that image is appearing in your journal article. And, all right, so then the question is, how do these images actually get their way to the public? So these images are usually put into a press release along with a description of your findings. Um, that press release is picked up by a news outlet and then that news outlet assembles your images in a way that's accessible for the public. OK, but there's an alternate strategy that you can use to basically connect the public with your media. So one example is using a video sharing site. Another example, can you guys see this on the bottom? OK, is using a photo, a photo sharing site. Um, a third example is using social networks, and I'll be talking about all three of these today. So here's the outline of my talk. First, we're going to look at how science news outlets transform your images videos into multimedia news stories. Second, we're going to see how you can use new media platforms to connect general audiences to your research. And third, we'll wrap things up by looking at some do's and don'ts of capturing and sharing your media. OK, so before there was YouTube, there was America's Funniest Home Videos, which we were watching in the beginning. Does everyone know what this is? Have I seen the program before? OK. So sharing homemade media has been around since the 1990s. Uh, this program first premiered in 1989. It's been around for 21 seasons. It's the second largest running program on, on ABC. Um, let's see. And we looked at a few clips earlier, so I don't think we'll show this. OK, but what, what made this show possible uh, was that the first consumer camcorders came out in the 1980s. Um, and this allowed people to, to purchase these kind of bulky VHS tapes. I don't know if you guys remember using VCRs in the past. Um, and record homemade movies of their family or whatever other everyday events that they, want to, they wanted to show. OK, so what's happened since 1989? Well, first of all, the, the cost of these video cameras has dramatically decreased over time. Um, part of this is due to advances in storage media technology. So it went from VHS to mini DV, flash media. And these media technologies has allowed to, to also make these cameras a lot smaller. So here's like something called a flip. And now you can actually obviously record uh, streaming video on your iPhone. Um, another thing that's happened is that the, the uh, Uploading and downloading of images, the sharing of images and videos on the internet has been allowed by an increase in bandwidth starting in about 2000. This is not, this is not to scale, so just, this is for, um, just to give you an idea. But what's also happened is that because people can share these, these images and videos online, um, photo sharing uh, websites have popped up, such as Flickr. Video sharing websites have popped up, like YouTube. And media has also been shared over social networks, like Facebook. All right, so bottom line. So homemade digital media can be created and shared online at an incredibly fast rate and at virtually zero cost. And this has created a new demand by audiences for viewing multimedia content on the web. OK. 
OK, so let's, let's take a quick look about how America's Funniest Home Video program works. So homemade videos, they're submitted by the public. The videos are assembled into a sequence by an editor. And then the program is presented, by, presented or narrated by a host. And then the program is viewed by a general audience on television. So it turns out that science news outlets online have adapted this same media model. So what they do, they take homemade media, and this is images or, or video provided by the scientist, you guys. Um, they assemble the media into a sequence by something that's called a producer. The program is presented or narrated by a host, and sometime the host will also be the producer. And then the program is viewed by a general audience on the web. All right, so who is this multimedia producer? Well, it's, like I said, it's the person's going to assemble your media into a story based on the assets they can find. And this idea of finding these assets is really important because the easier they can find your media assets, the more time they can, they can work on telling your story. So let's take an example. Here's a video that appears on National Geographic website. Um, and its title is Deepest Ocean Eruption Filmed. So we're actually going to play the full clip. Researchers witnessed a spectacular, fiery, underwater volcano explosion and captured it on video. It's believed to be the deepest ocean volcano eruption ever recorded. The undersea Pacific Ocean explosions in May of this year were recorded using a remote operating vehicle. Under the tone of the vehicle motors, recorded by a hydrophone, you can hear the muffled sounds of the explosions, still audible under 4,000 feet of ocean water. An expedition team, which included researchers from the University of Washington and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, was conducting observations in an area of the Pacific bounded by the island nations of Samoa, Tonga, and Fiji. The eruption was southeast of Samoa. One of the lead scientists called it an underwater 4th of July. Images show large molten lava bubbles about three feet across, glowing red vents ejecting lava into the sea, and lava flows across the sea floor. This West Manta volcano stands more than a mile high off the ocean floor. Its eruptive area is about the length of a football field. It is producing bonanite lavas, believed to be among the hottest erupting on Earth in modern times. Researchers believe they have a unique chance to study magma formation and how the Earth recycles material where tectonic plates slide against each other. A microbiologist on the team found diverse microbes in the extreme conditions, and they observed a small species of shrimp thriving. It's believed to be the same shrimp species found at eruptive sites more than 3,000 miles away. Mission scientists believe 80% of eruptive activity on Earth occurs in the ocean and most volcanoes are in the deep sea. But until this discovery, NOAA and the National Science Foundation had sponsored submarine volcano research for 25 years without observing a deep ocean eruption like this one, which is now recorded for all of us to see. So all the, all the media that was used to create that short film was actually included, included in this press release by NOAA. Um, this press release contains two video clips, which were used in the making of the video, and a couple of images. So now let's take a look at kind of like the media assets as they stand alone. So here's the first video clip. It's 25 seconds in length.
here is the second video clip, which is called the wide shot that you saw in the video. part of the press release were a couple of images. So there was one satellite photo, one high resolution photo taken from the camera, a map of the seafloor basin, and then a picture of the shrimp that were part of that basin. And these were all the assets that were provided by the scientists and that were included in the press release. So if we look, look at the breakdown of the shots that appear in the video, the video was, was 218 total. First 20 seconds, they use clip one, the zoom shot that you guys just saw. From 21 to 40, they use clip two, the wide shot. Then they introduce the satellite photo, which was part of one of the images provided. Then they go back to clip two, the wide shot, repeat that. And then they go to the first photo, which is the one shown right here. And then two freeze frames appear, which are basically still captures of the video images which are very easy to produce using editing software. Then they show a map that was provided of the underwater volcano. We go back again to clip one, the zoom shot, introduce the shrimp, and then finish off with going back to clip two a second time. And that's, that's all that was needed to tell that story. So let's take out another example. This is, new, this is from New Scientist. Um, this is, I believe it came out a couple weeks ago. And this is total 29,000 views so far. Actors can now quickly get a new on-screen body, thanks to a new system. It combines 3D scans from hundreds of people to create an average body shape. The model can be applied to an actor selected in a single film frame. Then the body shape can be altered and automatically applied to every shot. With this new software, actors will no longer have to alter their weight for a new role. <laughs> All right, so that's the total 60 second video format that they, that they normally produce. All right, so let's go and look at the media assets. So to produce that 60 second video, which has been watched nearly 30,000 times, all they required was four media clips, which were provided by the scientist. So the scientists at the Max Planck Institute released this supplemental video to go along with our journal article. So let's go see what that supplemental video is all about. And then maybe you guys can call out when you see each one of these clips appear in the video. Movie Reshape is a system for tracking and reshaping of humans in videos. Here you see an original image sequence taken from the famous Baywatch TV series. On the right, you see a sequence that was modified with movie reshape. By simply increasing the value of the muscularity control slider, the running actor is rendered more muscular. The algorithm is based on a morphable model of 3D human shape and pose that was learned from laser scans of real subjects. Here you see all male and female 3D scans that were acquired. Note the large shape variation between the scan subjects. The learning model can be used to vary semantically meaningful attributes of the body shape. The attributes here can be interactively modified by the user, such as height, shown here. It is also possible to change the muscularity attribute, as it was used for the Baywatch example in the beginning of the video. Here we change the leg length. By checking the box in front of the sliders, the user can select which attribute should be kept fixed while the current attribute is changed. 
for example, during the modification of the waist girth, the height and the leg length of the subject should be maintained. In this example, we employed our method of multi-view data captured in a controlled studio environment with blue screen background. This allows the automatic extraction of silhouettes by color and difference key. The morphable model of 3D human shape and pose is used to fully automatically track the actor in the video. As the scene was taken in a blue screen environment, we can replace the background with a virtual scene. We can now change the height of the actor using the height slider. Here we made her smaller. Afterwards, the change is automatically applied to all the frames of the video. Our user interface gives a direct feedback and it is easy for a designer to achieve a certain artistic goal. We can also make her 20 centimeters taller. In this example, we increase the waist girth of the basketball player. Here you see a comparison of different values for the waist girth. In the video on the left, an extremely large waist girth increase was performed. This is again the Baywatch example from the beginning of the video. Different levels of muscularity are shown. In the video on the right, the muscularity of the running actor was increased by 30%. Alright, so that's the entire video that they put out. As you can see for this example, the producer that cut together these clips had a lot more media assets to work with. Um, but they still came up with something that was that worked with their short short form program format. Alright, let's take another example. This is these are much shorter. So this is um, this video is called Ant Circle. It was posted by just a user of YouTube and the clip is 30 seconds. So what do you think can actually be done with a clip like this? Well, let's, let's see what Discovery News came up with. Perhaps you've seen this on YouTube. It's a huge number of ants marching in a spiral. It's bizarre, and we wanted to find out exactly what's going on. To find out, we went to USDA research entomologist Sanford Porter. What's going on in this video is we have an endless circular mill of ants, and they're probably army ants, and what's happening is each ant is following the, the, the trail pheromone, the, the trail chemical of the ant in front of it, and they've got looped around so that they're following endlessly their neighbors. Now the problem we have is that army ants are blind, and that's probably what these are, and they are very dependent on following trails. When the trails get looped around on themselves, the mill just goes round and round and round generally until the uh, ants simply die. And they're all running as fast as they can to, to get back to their colony, but uh, uh, they've got looped so that they will endlessly run until it's over. Those poor little guys from Discovery News, I'm James Williams, and that's Ant Circle Explained. All right, so that's a great example of how a very small clip, 30 seconds, not even shot really well. It's kind of a shaky camera, you know, it's not the best uh, framing. But 
by taking that clip and putting it into a story format, they can introduce not just the video, but also the science behind that clip. And so far, that clip has 75,000 views on YouTube. Uh, so let's see. So the take home message, a little media can go a very long way. So when you think about that the media you have in the lab, you might have one or two images, two or three video clips, whatever. Um, but a good multimedia producer can tell a story with what you got. All right, at, this, at this point <laughs> in, in the talk, you might be saying, well, moving images are not, are not really part of my research. You know, I don't have anything that's kind of like video worthy. Um, this is a great alternative for you. You can look at photo galleries and image collections are very popular as well. So here's something that Wired Science put together. Um, this is a basically a photo gallery um, that was on their website using 14 images taken from the International Space Station. Um, with each image, they wrote a very brief description about what was seen, what was, was featured in, in each photo. So where do those images come from? Well, they came from the NASA Multimedia Gallery. So the producer basically went through 29 pages of media and then found the ones that would best tell that story to their audience. OK, but you don't always have to rely on web producers putting, collecting your media, organizing into a collection. Uh, this is something that was done at Stanford University 3D, uh, Stanford University Medical School. Um, they basically took images from their 3D radiology lab. Their 3D radiology lab produces over 200 images each year um, of, 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 the, um, of the research that comes, that comes from there. And, and basically, they took a collection of 17 images, added a headline, some relevant tags, and a short description of each photo and then put it on a photo sharing site like Flickr. And this allowed an, a new audience to see all these. So, so this photo collection has received so far 8,000 views. Um, and in addition to that, this was actually picked up by, everyone knows what Boing Boing is? It's kind of like a media aggregate? OK. Um, the collection was picked up by Boing Boing, Boing and they wrote a short description about the collection and saying, the Stanford University School of Medicine has a fascinating Flickr stream. Most recently, they added a small set of interesting images from their 3D radiology lab. So what they're doing here is basically introducing their audience, entirely new audience, from the people who would normally go to the Stanford 3D radiology website, see the images, um, and exposing basically your science. And what this is about, like I said, like I mentioned in my talk, was that this is really about creating a bridge for people to form new connections to your research. So, for example, this is one of the images that came from the 3D radiology lab collection, um, which is basically an image of the chest cavity. And let's see. And these little uh, yellow spots right here are basically plaque deposits. So, Matt Man the ogre. A user, a pro user on Flickr, writes the question after seeing this photo: How do you avoid cal calcified plaque deposits? How do you remove them once you have them? And one of the admins of the Flickr account on, on Stanford Medicine basically wrote up a, a nice response, explains to that person what what is actually happening in that photo. And again, the question is: Would Matt Man the Ogre ever think about this question on their own? without actually seeing this photo on the website. And then not only just having the question, but being able to go deeper into the research by having one of the scientists kind of respond to that question. So now you've just basically added their understanding, you've increased their, their science understanding. Um, OK, so basically creating your virtual bridge to new audiences. Again, all this media basically already exists somewhere on your lab homepage, on your institute homepage. What it really needs is just a bridge to connect it to an online audience. So right here, as you can see, you're using Flickr, photo sharing, uh, photo sharing site, creating a nice, this very small collection, something that's very easy to do, and giving access to this audience who wouldn't normally 
Google 3D radiology have, you know, be connected to this, this site in any way. Another example. Um, so the, the, the video example, the new scientist video example we saw, all those images and media were actually included in the journal article produced by Max Planck Institute. And the supplemental video they put out, they said, okay, great, we're going to take all this media, we're going to have someone cut together a video, and then we're going to post it on YouTube. And that supplemental video alone has amassed almost 800,000 views. So, so 800,000 people that probably wouldn't normally have access to this journal article are now understanding a good fraction of what that, that research is about just by watching your video. And the access is, is happening because it's on this video sharing site. It's, it's, it's made accessible. Um, okay, so questions. So why use, why utilize video and photo sharing sites? Well, the benefits, number one, is that they're search optimized. Uh, the media on your lab website may not be. So how, how the media is tagged, how it has headlines. People can easily put in a term, say, like brain or 3D radiology, and those, those images will pop up. Um, also, these sites, they do the marketing for you. There's a number of user actions that can be taken once people look at your media. So for example, your media can be shared between users. They can be embedded on blogs or other websites. People can email them to their friends. They can be favorited and be part of a favorite collection of that user. And they can also be added to playlists, which, would, which, which, which basically all these things would amass in more views of your media, more exposure to your science. Um, and again, they also create opportunities for discovery. So how, has everyone seen a video on YouTube before? OK, how many people have watched a video on YouTube and watched another video that's been recommended? either on the sidebar or something's popped up at the very end, right? OK, so basically this, this idea of like serendipitous discovery uh, is very popular for, for video sharing sites like YouTube. Um, actually, a majority of the videos that people watch on that site are actually just stumbled upon. No one's actually searching for those videos. They just happen to see after watching another video or seeing it in the sidebar. So let's talk briefly about creating connections on Facebook, social networks. I'm actually going to talk a little bit more about this in my talk tomorrow, but we'll look at just one benefit of sharing your media on, on Facebook, and that's basically connecting with a targeted audience. All right, so first of all, how many people have Facebook profiles? All right, how many people actually, actually use their Facebook profile actively? Right enough? Okay. Um, so I'm sure you guys are familiar with Facebook fan pages as well. Has everyone liked their home and you want a Facebook fan page? Okay, Facebook fan page is basically, it's, it's uh, fan, did you say fan, page? fan page, yeah, Facebook fan page. So it's basically a page dedicated to, say, an organization, a school, um, a magazine that people, that people can interact with um, using and connect with kind of like that, whoever is that host. General, general explanation. <laughs> um, so Facebook fan page examples. Uh, let's see. So UC Santa Barbara has a Facebook fan page. Uh, Harvard University. Um, Nature. New Scientist magazine. Science Now, which is from Science Magazine. Um, and then Neuroscience Researchers, which is just another, another group on Facebook. And they all have specific audiences that like that like these pages, so they're somehow connected. Something's drawing them um, to these places. So what, one way of utilizing this is that if you have media, maybe say a new scientist covers your research article, um, and you, you have, may have a collection of images that you'd want to share with them, but they only end up using one as part of the editorial. You can post something on, say, at new scientists on their fan page, say, hey, I love the coverage of my article, but please, here's a link to checking out more of my images. And again, you're bridging that audience of 8,500 people who are maybe already checking out your research article and their coverage of, of, of your research, but also you're connecting them to your images or to, to basically your website, your research. OK, so let's, let's look briefly at some kind of images, photos, do's and don'ts. Um, so do provide high resolution photos and images when you're utilizing these, these sharing sites. Um, also think about providing extra space around the subject. 
Um, the web producer can always magnify the image, zoom in on an image. Um, so don't do too many close-ups. Also, don't um, think about uploading charts or graphs from that appear in your articles. This is kind of boring, and it's also not very visually appealing, though the, the producer can't do much with it. Um, also, don't upload images with unnecessary markings. So if we go back to our National Geographic video example, this is the photo that they actually ended up using in the video. So they, they had to take off this scale, they had to take off this, this other scale, and then also this description. Um, and they probably, I don't think they did this in Photoshop, but I think they probably had to actually go back and ask the researcher to provide this image without all these markings. So when you think about uploading, uploading your media, think about saying, well, either one, upload two versions, one with the tags and one without, or think about just putting, putting all these markers in the image description so people can still understand what, what the image is about. Okay, some video do's and don'ts. Try and provide the highest resolution footage available. Um, use a tripod you know, or something that's just solid to rest the camera on so you get a steady shot. And make sure you provide clips that are greater than 10 seconds. Two second clips don't really work out because they're just very too brief. You can't loop them, you can't really do much with them. But anything 10 seconds to 30 seconds range as we saw in the examples is something that's very easy to work with. Um, and the don'ts are just pretty much the opposites of, of these three points. Try not to use low resolution as it doesn't really work well. Shaky images, it's kind of jarring for the, the audience. And short clips. Okay, uploading, uploading your images. Here's some other do's and don'ts. Okay, don't just upload an image to a sharing site and expect people to find them. You have to optimize the search and accessibility of your media by providing smart headlines, tags, and descriptions. Um, also, don't use alphanumeric titles or jargon-filled descriptions. Um, by alphanumeric titles, this will usually kind of pop out. If you take a photo with your, your video camera, or I mean your digital camera, this is kind of how it'll pop out in the, in the naming of the file. When you upload this to a video sharing site, just give it a real name, cat, something, something very basic. All right, do you guys want to do some practice tagging and creating some headlines? All right, so here's first, first tagging practice. All right, give me some, some relevant tags that would describe this photo. I think you should take the, the, the numbers out in the right corner. This is, this is the copyright. <laughs> Good catch, though. Um, all right, so relevant tags? Anyone? Yogi Bear. Yogi, Yogi, Yogi Bear? Bear. Great. Boo Boo? Boo Boo. Maybe Basket, also? Um, and then maybe a general, a more general tag, Cartoon? Cartoon? You actually nailed all of them. That's pretty good. Those are all the ones I had listed. Um, so what these tags do is that when people are searching for your media, they can type in a, ta a tag like saying, hey, I'm looking for pictures of Yogi Bear. So if your picture is tagged that says Yogi Bear, they're going to be connected to this photo from their search, from their search results. Or if they say maybe picnic basket, this photo will, pick, will, will appear. Or cake. Or fruit. Um, let's do another one. All right, what would be, what would be some... Some some relevant tags for, for this for this image. Weird machine. Weird machine. <laughs> okay. Must be a, is it a jetpack or something. Jetpack. Yeah. Jetpack. Yes. You got that one. Maybe maybe man. <laughs> it's a very general tag. Um, you know, even a broader tag. How about awesome? <laughs> Science fiction. Science fiction. I don't know if this guy's actually real. I didn't check out the website. But inventor. Inventor. Nice. Good one. All right. Bringing back to the science. How about this one? Look for a tag in a description. Neural. What? Neural? Neuron. Neuron. Neuron? OK. Neuron. What else? Anyone know the technique used to? Fluorescence. Fluorescence. Microscopy. Yes. Um, how about general, more general? Neurons exist in the, in the brain. Awesome. Connections, and maybe? Connections, yes. Um, 
also another general tag, science. When people are looking just for general, general images, you can just look for science. Um, and maybe an appropriate headline for this photo would be perhaps just combining some of those tags, fluorescent mic microscopy of a neuron, single neuron. So it's not too jargony, but it kind of captures what, what, the, uh, what the photo contains. All right, when you start using um, all these kind of new media platforms, make sure when you have your, your, lab, your lab homepage or your personal homepage, make sure you guys connect them, connect these platforms to your, your page. So put on a little icon that says, here's, here's my Flickr page, here's my YouTube page, here's my Facebook profile. And this will likely be a, another good entry point for when people see you on your, on your homepage, they're gonna be interested in clicking on what photos you have, what videos you have. People love watching photos and video. All right, take home message. Oh, three points and we're almost wrapped up here. All right, so think about the visual aspects of your research and capture them with the right tools. Utilize media sharing sites and let your media do the work for you. And again, have people from your home institution help you to assemble your media. You don't have to be an expert at doing this. There's people that exist um, through your press offices um, and et cetera um, that, that can help you do this. And if there isn't anyone there, you can have them hire me. Here's my, here's my email address <laughs> and I'll help you out. Um, and basically, just another kind of last point, uh, just last, last point to remember. So the work you do each day is fascinating. Um, with your media, you can inspire others to understand more about your science. So don't take for granted the things you do every day to, you know, each day to day in the lab. Um, that's it, that's all I got. Thanks. Do you have questions? Well, it's all about images, but I suppose that there has to be, I mean, there has to be a story there, right? I mean, if you don't, if you have only a nice image, but nothing, I mean, I suppose that the picture of a neuron wouldn't do much mm -hmm. without a story. I mean, yeah, sure. people might look at it and go Google images, whatever, when they need a picture of a neuron, but there has to be kind of a story attached, I suppose. Yes. I mean, and, and that's basically, you know, kind of like the role of the the web, the multimedia producer. It's kind of like, you know, find, find that narrative thread. Um, but also, it's basically, I mean, like, if you provide me on one photo, but maybe, you know, Five or six, you know, or ten, you know, that, that story can kind of reveal itself. Um, no, good question. Basically, your point is, you don't have to put out the story. You can just put out, you know, you don't have to wait to have everything and then put something out. Just put out a picture. Somebody else could pick it up and put it into a story. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, what has been deterring me is, and I feel okay. Maybe when it's perfect something comes together, then one can put something on mm -hmm. it. But your point is, uh, I mean, if one has to see it a little bit from the public eye. Right, right. And again, I mean, you don't also have to wait until um, your, your research is, you know, your journal articles are going to be published. You can put out kind of like ongoing um, images from your ongoing research that will kind of spark this interest. You know, again, because people don't see People don't have access to, you know, like uh, what a neuron likes under a fluorescent microscope. That's not something people see every day. It might be something you see every day, but it's it, 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 there's a lot of interest there. So, good question. Anyone else? All right. Thanks for coming. I really appreciate you guys making the time to come here.